Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for part two of the Criminals, Cutthroats and Convict series on Chow Hayes, Sydney's first and most notorious gangster. Now we have spoken previously about Chow's upbringing. He was raised in a house full of women. Mother Elizabeth, Auntie Ninny and Grandma Rose for most of his childhood. His father went away to war and was shell-shocked upon his return, dying only a few years later. The lack of a male role model from the age of three, coupled with incest provided by a young promiscuous visiting aunt and cousin Edgy Bollard, introducing him to local gangs, had a lot to do with how his life unfolded. A straight path was never going to be enough for Chow. He had other ideas and learned at an early age how he can manipulate his family. Although he loved them dearly, he found he could lie and get away with a lot. If you haven't watched part one, definitely do that before seeing this, as it provides a lead up to how this cheeky Sydney kid became one of the most hardened criminals of Sydney for the most part of the 20th century. Chow's childhood aligns him with many upcoming underworld figures who also write their name in blood against Sydney sandstone buildings and cobbled stone streets. This network of people Chow Hayes was associated with also becomes those he would work for, alongside and on occasions against over the coming decades. He though would become a fearless gunman and gangster, the first bloke to be named as such in the country. From where we left off in part one, much of the next few years, Chow is shoplifting with the railway mob and getting out of jail time at Long Bay. By paying fines from the sold spoils, he finds that appealing these charges, he's granted bail and it gave him time to come up with the money to pay the larger fines. He could then get back into continuing his shoplifting racket. Becoming quite the entrepreneur, he used standover tactics on the Central Railway Frankfurt and Roll Cellar for protection money, much like the Mafia organisations would have. Should they refuse, they would cop a nick from his razor, which was embedded in a cork. From this point onward, Chow's criminal profile and status rose with great speed. As part of the railway big mob, or push, they had several clashes with the rocks push, which for the most part they were evenly matched for wins and losses to their beatings. On one occasion, when Chow was 17, he was attacked by the rocks push while alone and he copped a fractured skull and 15 stitches. He sustained a second skull fracture a few years later by the Surrey Hills mob and they too beat him bloody. Chow almost losing his life due to the pressure from the swelling of his skull, his grandmother being told he may not make it. However, he recovered well, being the tough nut he was. Cops would never get involved in fights for their own safety as they patrolled in pairs and could easily be overcome by a large push. During these years, he tells of a time he had an altercation with Frank Green. He had just been released from Parramatta Jail and he had asked to give a message to a Charles Chili Smith from the prison, so he heads over to Chili's place and notes that Frank Green is his heavy. Chili was running an illegal SP from his home on Palmer Street, not far from Tilly's, and had Green there to take care of business should anyone not pay or get upset on an outcome. On this occasion, whilst Chow is visiting, Frank has a girl with him. Chili invites Chow in for a drink and Chow gives Chili the message from prison, which was that the cops were onto them and he shouldn't visit. Whilst Chow is talking, Frank gets the idea that Chow is flirting with his girl and as Chow finishes up, gets up to leave, Frank King hits him and he falls to the floor. Frank stands over and, and yells at him saying that he shouldn't be trying to hit on his woman. Well, Chow is fuming. But he is in Chili's home and doesn't want to cause any grief. Chili and another man, Chapman, drag Green away. Chow gets up and wipes the blood from his mouth. He says goodbye to Chili and spends the next few hours across the road waiting for Green to leave. Chow had found a block of wood on a construction site nearby and fashioned it into a club. Finally, some hours later, Frank emerges with the woman 
from Chili's place. And Chow waits just long enough for him to go about halfway down the road before he stalks Frank, calls out to him, I've got something to tell you. And Frank turns around, drunk, and says, what? Chow says he wants to give him this and clubs him to the face, breaking his jaw and several teeth. Chow stated that the woman just stood there watching until Chow had finished his ass whooping of Frank and walked off. As he walked away, maybe a 100 metres, then he heard the woman hollering for help for the now indisposed Frank Green. Now Frank always threatened to get revenge on Chow and he saw him time after time, but Chow states he never bothered. It was believed that Frank had been warned off by many not to mess with Chow as he was an up-and-coming youngster and they thought he was quite mad. During the Depression in the early 1930s, Chow and his railway mob mates, Kicker Kelly, Spud Murphy and Eddie McMillan, had shoplifting ventures, one of which included a new swimwear that was basically the new thing. It was making a name for itself as the times were changing and the old, all covered up swimsuit were being overshadowed now by a newer, more revealing type. They were making a killing selling these new Jatsen swimsuits that they'd ripped off from somewhere. One night at the Eden Billiard Room, they were selling a few of these swimsuits to people. But they were also approached by a hardened gunman that they'd known about called Norman Mickey MacDonald. He ends up going over and asking about the garments, taking a whole heap under his arm and just walking away. Chow waited for him to come back inside, thinking that he was going to pay them, but he doesn't. MacDonald comes back in and just goes over and starts up a billiard game with some of his mates. Now Chow was really pissed off at this stage. He walks up to him and says, where's the money? Is this a joke? To which MacDonald replied, I ain't paying for nothing. Chow walks away. Now, he knew this guy was a gunman and Chow didn't have a gun. So he goes over to Kelly and says, this isn't fair. And he gets really worked up and stews over it for a while. Then decides he's just going to approach him again, but this time in a heavier way. He goes over, gets a cue stick off the rack cracks it in half, and then cracks it across the back of McDonald's skull, fracturing it. Now, none of McDonald's guys even get involved, and Chow's able to just beat him until he's lifeless on the floor. Chow and his mates leave the venue, and McDonald is taken to the hospital. McDonald vows to get revenge, and Chow counters this with a time and a place for the showdown. However, on the night they meet up to fight it out, Chow, even bringing along his uncle, Herbert Hubie Hayes, who had a gun with him, McDonald backs down and states that he doesn't want to fight and that they should just stay out of each other's way. Well, Chow's happy with that. They shake on it and leave it at that. Perhaps McDonald, having already been beaten to a bloody pulp, decides that he doesn't really want to see how far Chow would take it. Now, further still, Chow's reputation for violence rises when he defends his cousin, Ezzy Bollard, who was in a leg cast. Jim Pansy Barron Jr., whom a few weeks earlier, Ezzy had stolen his girl from another dance hall, attacks Ezzy and knocks him down at the Lansdowne Hotel. Chow's with him. Chow uses Ezzy's crutch to beat in the face of this coward, knocking several teeth across the dance floor. Now in 1932, Chow gets married. He's 21 and he marries Gladys Muriel King, also known as Topsy. They went to pretty much the same school. She went to the sister school of St. Benedict's. And he'd kind of been dating her since he was 17. And she'd stuck by him while he was in Bathurst jail. She even tried to get him to go on the straight and narrow when he decided to give up shoplifting, as now he would receive the maximum sentence each time he was caught, being a year in jail. And that's where he was serving at Bathurst Jail. He was sentenced to a year but only did 10 months. But taking advice from the Bathurst inmates he networked with, Chow had more sinister things in mind. Upgrading from the razor and various other forms of weapons he'd used in the past, he decided it was time to buy a gun. 
He purchases a 22 caliber pistol for five pounds and practices shooting trees at Centennial Park. This assisted in gaining more income as a standover at Sly Grog Houses, such as Ma Brown's Illicit Booze House in Riley Street and Kate's various Sly Grog dens around the city. He and the railway mob would walk into a place and get protection money. If it was refused, they would smash up the place, but they usually got about £10 a week from most places, and that was to keep the place protected from Chow and his mates, but also if anyone else tried, Chow would stand up for the place. Topsy was working to help pay for their rental at 156 Bridge Road Glebe after they were married. He couldn't tell Topsy what he really did, so she was working and bringing home the majority of the money that she knew about. But one day she finds his gun at home and realises just what kind of world he is in. However, being in love with him, she stuck by him. Chow begins working for various two-up games or schools, as they were called at the time, around the city, the first being Bub Brown's game in Young Street, Redfern. He was also becoming a big gambler himself, mostly betting on horses at the track and seemed to do all right on the punt. After a particular win, he was able to move them from Glebe to the place he would live in up until he was given the death penalty. But this was commuted to life in prison in 1951 for a murder which we will reveal the details of as the story unfolds. But they were able to move into a terrace house on Thomas Street in Ultimo. Transitioning out of the shoplifting caper, Chow would become heavily involved with various two-up sites which would pay him a weekly tribute. This was a retainer which meant when they needed to call on Chow, he would come. These two-up games had bouncers inside, but should those bouncers not be able to handle the trouble, they would call on Chow and his gang. Chow being known as a gunman now. Also, doing debt collecting for the two-up games, threatening the families of those who hadn't paid. On occasions, he fired deliberately to miss troublemakers just to threaten them rather than kill them, but he wasn't scared to use the gun if he needed to. Tomo's two-up games, of which there were various locations dotted around the city, originally run by Joe Tomo, hence the name, but then were run by racetrack punter Joe Taylor, whom Hayes had begun working for on a regular basis. In 1937, Kate employs a young hood by the name of Henry John Jack Baker to try and stop Chow and his mates standing over her sly grog dens. She figured paying Jack a smaller amount was a better business decision than Chow and his mates taking more. However, it doesn't work in her favour as Jack is shot by Chow in front of the Lansdowne Hotel when he tries to stop Chow running his own business. Although police nabbed Chow based on witnesses around at the time, when they brought him before Baker in the hospital to get a positive ID, Baker says he'd never seen him before in his life. As was the way it was handled in those days, many, even on their deathbed, would die before giving up their own murderer to the cops. Baker recovered and Chow continued his standover tactics with Kate, but strangely, Baker and Chow worked together at Kate's place, Kate herself giving up on trying to be rid of Chow and using him where she could to her advantage. Chow was primarily a loner. He had a few blokes who he'd work with on a regular basis, but as for aligning himself to a particular gang or criminal organisation of the day, he was and much rather the freedom of freelancing. But of course, being a free agent with a certain amount of diplomacy, it's no good taking on work that in doing so would be a clear indication that he was being paid, for example, by the Lee Gang to undermine or hurt the earning potential of the Divine Gang. In doing so, alliance him without any doubt to the Kate Lee mob without him declaring he was. The position Chow Hayes enjoyed had no loyalty except to himself, just another reason he was able to survive it all. But far the most lucrative and certainly the easiest work that Chow was tasked with, mostly by the Kate Lee gang, was that of collecting outstanding debts that a particular punter may be ducking from making good on. If Chow came round on her behalf to claim payment, his reputation alone now was enough to ensure the punter would make available all money owed, with a little extra for his troubles without further delay. 
There was also work he was given to dish out an extremely violent and painful form of street justice to anyone stupid enough to go ahead and rob one of the lucrative booze or drug distribution outlets run by either main gang, be it directly or as an associate trying to stiff the ladies out of the full value of the goods. Their mistake would be visited by the formidable and merciless fists, boots and threats or 45 auto if that's what was called for. Made no difference to him, feared gunman and underworld heavy Chow Hayes. The service of Chow Hayes was employed and always with the same result. A good one for himself and his current paymaster. Of the police in these days, Chow states he never bothered to try and bribe them. One, because he didn't want what he stole to be in anyone else's pocket. But two, because they were really honest in these days and weren't bribable, or not most of them. Something he says changed dramatically by the mid-50s. Around this time, Chow flees to Queensland after an altercation with another railway Big Mob member. He does a bit of stealing up there, but ends up caught and in the infamous Boggo Road Jail for four months. On his return to Sydney, he starts taking out a young girl even though he's married to Topsy. But his story goes that he liked the girl and was out at the Furlong Hotel showing her a good time when a guy appears and says, a knocker McGarry is outside and wants to talk to Chow. So Chow goes outside to see who this knocker fellow is. And when he meets him, he says to Chow, you're married and you're too old to be dating that girl. Chow says, she can date whoever she wants to date and it was none of his business. And Chow goes back inside. About an hour later, Knocker comes back to the club and asks to see Chow again. Chow goes outside, reluctantly, and find out what this joker wanted. But when he walked outside, down to the lane by the furlong, Knocker pulls out a gun and shoots Chow in the stomach, then proceeds to run away into the darkness. Well, Chow's shot in the stomach now, so he ends up sitting in the gutter, bleeding. The shot alerted the people inside and from neighbouring shops and houses, and someone rings the police and the ambulance. Before long, the police were there, and Sergeant Ray Blissett, a fair cop that Chow knew, stayed with him in the ambulance and in the hospital. But he was trying to get Chow to say who shot him. Although Chow was well aware that it was Knocker, as per the code, he says to Ray Blissett from his hospital bed, All right, I'll tell you, as long as you leave me alone, stop pestering me. Come closer. So Ray gets close to Chow to hear who it is that he's going to say shot him. And Chow says, It was Father Christmas. He hit me with a broken bottle. Shortly after they removed the bullet, Chow escapes from the hospital only in a hospital gown and socks, not wanting to be pestered anymore by the cops, calling a mate to come and get him. He disappears into the night. Well, the whole ordeal was in the newspapers the next day, including the joke about Father Christmas. Chow says it became one of Sydney's most well-known criminal tales for some time. Now, as for Knocker, he gives himself up at the station, stating that he shot Chow. But when the police finally track Chow down to get a statement from him, Chow says, nah, it wasn't Knocker. I know who shot me and it wasn't him. So the police couldn't charge Knocker. However, Chow doesn't let the shooting go unanswered for, which could have been the reason why Knocker was giving himself up, as well as the police keen to find Chow so he doesn't take Knocker out himself. After a few days recovering, he found out where Knocker would be. So he took his gun with him and staked out a spot where he knew he could pick him off. However, someone notices Chow loitering around and calls the police. Well, when they get there, it's Ray Blissett again with another officer. They find the gun in Chow's possession and take him to the station to charge him for attempted murder. They say to Chow, look, we know it was Knocker and now you're going to go try and kill him. <laughs> so they book him and take him to the station so as to prevent the outcome. In the 
questioning down at the station, the evidence was left on the table in front of Chow, that being his gun and the bullets separated. But when the policemen were distracted by a third officer, Chow snatches up one of the bullets and pops it into his mouth, swallowing it, rendering their police case against him useless. As when it came time in front of a magistrate, the police stated that he'd had a fully loaded gun and one in the chamber. However, one of these bullets is now missing and the police were sure they had all of them. They didn't know how Chow managed to do it, but he gets off the charge because their evidence was tampered with. Chow actually enlists in the war in 1940, but he gets a letter a couple of weeks later rejecting him due to his lengthy criminal record. So Chow continued throughout the war doing what he did. Chow had a few children with Topsy by now. A couple had died young. Topsy stopped trying to turn Chow honest, and as he stated, she began living just for the kids when they came along. In 1941, Chow was arrested for armed robbery on an SP or starting price bookie, so they knew he had money. Chow and a bunch of other guys hold him up at his house. And he swears he will remember them. He lets them take the money. Chow gets four years jail time. He was positively identified by that man. He knew them. So it was easy for him to nick down to the police station and dog them in. In this four years, he is sent to Long Bay, where he assaults another inmate. And then transferred to Bathurst. And then again onto Goulburn Jail. He stated out of all of them, Goulburn was the worst he'd ever been in. Upon Chow's return back to Sydney, he forms part of a group who swindled people out of money for boxes of cigarettes. Of the four in the group, Wayman was the man to carry the cash when the deal was completed and then they'd all get out of there real quick. However, although Wayman said he grabbed the money, he said he was also grabbed by the men straight afterwards when everyone ran off. He lied though and took the money for himself because they caught up with the men that they'd cheated and they said that they hadn't got anything back. So when Chow realises he's been had by the mate, he vows to get even. At first his attempts fail, although he shoots Wayman at the next party, he only wounds him and no one gives up on Chow, it was all their mates. When they meet again, Wayman pleads with Chow that he will pay the money back, he even goes to the bank and draws it out, hands it to him. But Chow knows Wayman isn't the kind of guy that forgets something like this. He wouldn't forget that Chow tried to kill him, and Chow knows he would have to finish him off, or he might come after him. It turns out that New Year's Eve 1944 was the night. Chow and Wayman were at different New Year's Eve parties, although Wayman's wife was, was actually at the party Chow goes to in Paddington. Wayman goes to a party in Newtown, and one of the guys who was in the cigarette group, Bedford, goes to the party that Wayman's at. And then after that party, he comes across to Paddington, but he goes there to tell Chow that Wayman planned to knock him off. Chow suspected he might, and he decides to use New Year's Eve night to his advantage. With all the fireworks going off, who would hear a gun? Now Bedford agreed to help Chow, and he drives him to Chow's place to grab his gun, and then parks around the corner from Wayman's place. Now they know it would be only Wayman inside, as it's been confirmed he left the party and gone home. Wayman's wife was at Paddington, so it was only him inside. Chow goes straight in with his gun and finds Wayman laying on his bed having a smoke. Chow told him he brought it on himself, and before Wayman could say very much, shoots him five times. He watches Wayman roll off the bed and then takes off. He assumes he's dead, but then he wasn't last time he tried to shoot him. Now Bedford, in the getaway car, drives them both back to Paddington New Year's Eve party. And shortly after they've just gotten out of the car, 
Chow's cousin, Ray Bollard, is his brother, drives past and says Chow come for a drink on New Year's Eve. So he quickly ducks inside of the party to keep his alibi strong as nobody really knew he'd left, saying he was going with his cousin. Everyone waves him off. Bedford decides to stay at the party with Wayman's wife and his own wife and make sure that his alibi too is strong, as well as escorting Wayman's wife home later for her to find the body. Now, the police knew that he'd done it. I mean, they'd already caught him once hanging around with a gun nearby where Wayman was, picked him up and took him to the station over a possible attempted murder. And now, and now Wayman was dead and they knew Chow had done it and they dragged him off to the station. They were going to try and stick this to him. Chow had been laying low a couple of days after the deed was done, but then he was in a car travelling with some other guys and saw Edna, Wayman's wife, walking along the street. He hopped out and went to talk to her, but he was also noticed doing this by someone on the street who knew the police were looking for him and, of course, dobbed him in. So it wasn't long after they started talking that the police all snuck up and arrested him. But Edna didn't believe that he did it. And when they took her down to the station to get a statement from her about why she was talking to him and what she had to say about the whole thing, she denied that Chow did it and said that he was at the party she was at, so he couldn't have done it. And she kind of lied and said that they were the best of friends and there wasn't any reason why Chow would want to kill him. The police had no witnesses to prove that Chow did it, even though they strongly believed he did. So he was acquitted. There was nobody that would come forward and say that he did it. Nobody, even those who knew, wouldn't come forward. So he gets away with this crime. But there's actually a point in time where he admits to it. But the police decide at this point it's way too late. And he's already done time at that stage for murder. So they let it go. But on to that murder. And why? The situation that led up to why Chow Hayes was put in prison begin now. Chow was still working at the Tomo's two-up game for Joe Taylor, and so were a few other of his mates. If they happened to get arrested by the police, Joe Taylor would bail them out. There was an agreement that he'd look after them like that. And two of Chow's mates were arrested, and the bail was set. Joe gave the money to an ex-boxer, one of the people that, he, that worked for him, to run down and pay the bail. But he went and had a drink first and was a bit delayed, so this meant that two of Chow's mates waited a little longer than they should have to get bailed out. So next thing is that they go up to try and find out from Joe Taylor why it took so long to get bailed out. But Joe Taylor wasn't there. Instead, it was another fella named Goddard. Well, anyway, they were having a rant at Goddard and Goddard thought that they wanted more bail money or something like that. So it was a big argument. And one of the boxers that they employed as a bouncer, Bobby Lee, came out while this was all going on and asked what the commotion was about. Well, apparently they tried to all tell their own story over the top of each other and Bobby Lee just told two of Chow's mates to get nicked. He wasn't going to be paying him any more money. And they retorted. And Bobby ended up going back inside and getting some of his mates out to teach these two a lesson. So Bobby Lee and a couple of other boxers took two of Chow's mates that Chow's later said that weren't really fighters, they were just thieves, took them around the side and beat the living crap out of them. Well, when Chow finds out about this, he gets the cranks, obviously. It's his mates being beat up by these bouncers and Chow's a heavy, he's got you know, a gun and he put a bullet in any of them. Well, this is basically how it leads up. So Chow goes and finds Joe Taylor and asks what the hell's going on after he's gone and seen his mates who are all bandaged and stitched up. And Joe basically said, look, it was a misunderstanding just to leave it. Well, Chow's not going to leave it, is he? 
So he ends up later on, a couple of months later, getting into a brawl with Bobby Lee over the situation. He left it to the two mates of his to kind of fix it up, but they let it go. Well, being Chow, he never was going to let it go. So the story goes, Chow meets up with Bobby Lee several months later and the pot stirred again. They'd start up a brawl inside the pub, but people break it up. And then when they go to leave, Bobby and Chow leave at the same time, Chow gets a king hit in and knocks Bobby to the floor and starts laying the boot into him. Well, nobody jumped in. Only people were saying, you know, give it up, Chow, just leave him, you know, because Chow had the upper hand at this point and <laughs> Bobby was on the ground and he was kicking him. And this is basically the start of what happens next. Well, Bobby Lee's upset. Bobby's been, you know, probably cowardly punched by Chow. And Chow knows that if it had been a fair fight, Bobby probably would have won because Bobby's a fighter. He's a boxer, whereas Chow's a gunman. So, you know, other than Chow shooting him, Bobby probably would have won if it was a fist fight. But anyway, so, but Bobby's not going to leave it alone. And he knows that, you know, once Chow's on you, once Chow is unhappy with you and angry with you, the chances are he'll probably knock you off. I mean, everyone's heard the story of Wayman. Bobby was basically told by most people he knew to get in first and knock Chow off. And so that's what he attempts to do. Now, just as a sidebar quickly, Topsy has a sister and she's had a couple of kids. Now, Chow and Topsy have a lot to do with her kids, their little nieces and nephews, and they often have them over. At this particular point in time, her kids have grown up, so Topsy's niece and nephews are all kind of adults now, and they've been looking after Topsy and Chow's kids too, babysitting and such. Now, the youngest of these kids, Danny Simmons, is staying over with Topsy and Chow at the time, just hanging out. One particular night, Chow and Topsy take one of their kids out to the movies. One of their other sons is working, so Danny Simmons decides to stay at the place by himself before he's got to go out and meet a girl. Danny was a bit of a ladies' man. He was also a boxer, and he decided to stay in for a couple of hours before going and picking up his girlfriend. Bobby Lee is sitting in a car up from Chow's place and he watches people leaving the house. He sees Topsy and the daughter as well as another man leaving the house but he thinks that the man leaving is actually Topsy and Chow's son. He doesn't believe that it's Chow. He thinks Chow's still inside. So he waits for them to leave and he approaches the house going down a laneway. As he approaches the side of the house, he can see someone laying on the lounge through a dark window, and he believes this is Chow. So he raises his gun and puts a couple of shots into the man's head, escaping down the laneway and out of sight. Sadly, we know this isn't Chow. It's actually Chow's nephew, Danny Simmons, and he's now bleeding out on their couch. It was about most likely 7.30 at this point, and Chow and the family don't get home till about 11 o'clock. When they get home, Chow finds Danny on the couch and bloodied. He thinks that maybe Danny's just been in a fight, as he had been before, and was bleeding unconscious on the couch. So he tells the girls to leave out the front door immediately and wait outside for him. He goes in to check on Danny and try and wake him up. When he approaches Danny and looks more closely, he can see that there's four bullets in his head and he's dead. Very sad, he walks out and tells the girls that they need to go to the police station right away. Danny's been hurt and they need help. So they went to the police station to report it. At this point, Topsy doesn't know that Danny is dead. Danny is like a little brother to her, her favourite nephew, if you will. After the police return, someone blurts out that the boy's been dead for hours and she's a mess. Chow consoles Topsy as best he can. She's devastated. At first he wasn't sure whether it was someone trying to attack him 
or Danny, as Danny was a bit of a ladies' man. He'd probably stolen a few women in his time, so it could have been in retaliation to that. But then Chow remembers what happened with Bobby Lee, and he decides pretty quickly it was someone after Chow. And now he plans his revenge. Somebody is going to pay for Danny's murder. His family is being killed. And thus begins the retaliation. <laughs>